Well, good morning. Happy Resurrection Sunday. It's a joy to be with you this morning. Of course, every Sunday is a reminder of the empty tomb. Uh, if you happen to be named Anastasia, that's the Greek word for resurrection. If you happen to be named Zoe, the Greek word for life, those are regular reminders of an empty tomb. And this morning, I want to turn our attention to a resurrection theme, and it begins with death. So uh, let me open us in prayer, and we'll start our time together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning, this morning in particular when even our world stops and thinks about the fact that you walked out of your own tomb, that you, the author of life, subjected yourself to mortality, but in the end and in truth, mortality was always subject to you. You are Lord, uh, Lord of life, Lord over death, and you reign, and you are victorious. And all who belong to you, all who believe in you, all who have subjected ourselves to you get to be victorious over death as well. We long for that day when death, that, that final enemy, that last enemy, uh, when death itself dies and death will be no more. Uh, in the meantime, Lord, we in you get the foretaste of eternity. We get the present possession of eternal life. And for this, we thank you. Uh, we don't deserve to belong to you. We don't deserve to be victors over death. Uh, we are those who were born dead and had to be raised to new life by your power, by your grace and in your love. And so we just thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The topic for this morning's equipping hour is thanatology. Did, did we get all of the mass of slides up there? Okay, great. A um, lot of slides for you here this morning. There is an outline available for you on the website under equipping hour, uh, under resources there. So if you want to download all the notes, I, I would hate for your fingers to fall off trying to write down everything that we're talking about. All of the verse references are there for you in those notes. You can follow along in the slides. What I want to do this morning is give us biblical help for a universal condition. I want to prepare us for what is an inevitable malady. If you knew that someday you would catch some illness, that everybody does uh, eventually, but that you could take preventive measures against its consequences, surely you would do it. We're talking about death this morning, and, and you know that the mortality rate hovers right around 100%. I say right around because there are some unique exceptions. Enoch didn't die. Elijah didn't die. And so that pushes the mortality rate down just a little bit, slightly under 100%. But then, of course, Lazarus died and was raised again, and, and there were others who died and were raised again by the Lord Jesus Christ. And and so the mortality rate then goes back up over 100% because poor Lazarus had to die twice. One of the Greek words for death is thanos or thanatos. You've probably heard that title, that name, that word in uh, modern fictional accounts. And so thanatology is the study of death. What is death and what happens at death? And this morning we're going to begin a path down a study of thanatology. And when it comes to death, we, we take several approaches to death as a culture. Uh, number one, we just flat out avoid death. We, we don't like the topic. We don't want to think about it. We sort of dismiss it. We put it off to the periphery of our culture and our thoughts. In the olden days... The tombstones were lined up in the front yard of the church building. It would be nice to be able to do that out here. In fact, if, if the city codes would allow it, and, and if I go home to be with the Lord before the rapture, and if you could put my headstone out in the front parking lot, that'd be great. A perpetual reminder as people walk into a church that death is universal and the answers for death are inside. That would be a good reminder. But we don't do that anymore. We, we cremate and, and we put people away and, and, and the remains in, in boxes and, and under the ground in faraway places that are, 
that are nice and pleasant, but, but not on the thoroughfares of our daily travels. And we poke fun at death. That's, a, that's another response. We, we fictionalize death. We, we make death sort of an animated caricature. Here we have the, the celebration called Dia de los Muertos. And, and so you, you sort of make death a clown figure. Skeletons with makeup, and, and we dance and we eat tacos. We sort of just make fun of death to, to um, minimize it for ourselves. Another response to death is just to sanitize death. We, we make death in the abstract. We, we, we remove it for, from us in the sense of sort of cleaning things up. We, we euphemize the vocabulary of death. Now he's gone to a better place. He's, uh, he's departed and things like this that, that don't really get us close to the realities of, of life and death and what happens after death for mortals. And then there's the fourth response that probably is inevitable for all of us. When when death's visitation gets personal, everything changes. The the clown, skeleton, animations, and fictional movie depictions go away. The poking fun uh, is done and the joke is over. The abstractions are gone, the avoidance is impossible, and... Bitterness ensues, and the dark cloud of black hopelessness and nihilism. Death becomes real and up close and personal. But for the follower of Jesus Christ, of course, all of these things take a different flavor. And it is true that we grieve, it is true that death is an enemy, but we Do not grieve as the world does, as those who have no hope, no certain confidence in life promised in Jesus. The follower of Jesus has a totally different approach to death, and that's what I want to unite our hearts around this morning in this equipping hour. I want to do so by examining one of Jesus' curious statements. I want you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 11. And we're going to look at verses 25 and 26, and Jesus' parallel statements to Martha. Because we need to understand that these two statements back to back are not contradictory. Though at face value, we probably should assume that they are. In the world's reckoning of things, apart from the supernatural work of Jesus to conquer death, these two statements don't go together. And yet, look down with me at your Bibles at what Jesus says to Martha in her grief over the loss of her brother. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die, ever. Do you believe this? Martha says to him, yes. Does she know what she's answering? Has she thought about these two statements back to back? If you believe in me, you'll live even if you die. And if you believe in me, you'll never die. Shouldn't she be saying what we're saying this morning? Which one is it, Jesus? Which one of these statements is true? They can't both be true. (laughs) And of course, this from the lips of our Lord, they are both true. What we need to do this morning is understand how are these twin statements accurate and for whom? And so we're going to dive into this topic called thanatology. Jesus is not confused here. In John chapter 11, we have this remarkable scene of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus is the man who died twice, and this sign of raising Lazarus from the dead has so much rich theology. At its very base, it is a sign, that is a pointer, declaring something about Jesus. It is the greatest of his signs in the Gospel of John, and and it is the one that would precipitate his own death. By raising Lazarus from the dead, Jesus raises the ire of the religious leaders. They recognize that 
if Jesus keeps on like this, everyone will believe in him. This is a compelling sign, an undeniable sign. In fact, what do the religious leaders do after Jesus rises from the dead? They say, we got to take care of this Jesus. we got to kill him. And we need to kill Lazarus. At the end of this chapter, they, they are hunting down Lazarus to re-kill him, to bury the evidence of Jesus' power over death. Fundamentally, that is what this sign is about, Jesus' power over death, and, and frankly, the way Jesus changes death. Not only death in the abstract or, or death in its activities and consequences, but even here in this text, Jesus is changing the vocabulary of death. And all of this is pointing to His power. In fact, John 11.4 says that this would take place for the glory of God. How would the glory of God be manifested in the raising of Lazarus from the dead? So that the Son of God may be glorified. In other words, this sign is about the self-revelation of God in the person of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the theme of the book of John, John 20, 31. These have been written so that you may believe and that believing you may have eternal life. And John 11 occurs in three scenes. The first scene happens beyond the river. Look down at verse 1. A certain man was sick, Lazarus from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha, And it was the Mary who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. And so the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Now think about this. This is is reporting news to Jesus who sees through hearts and knows what people are thinking before they say it. But they're telling him, The one you love is sick. It's a remarkable scene because Jesus clearly loves people. Look down at verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. You see here the display of the sort of emotional palette of the Son of God in His earthly ministry. But look at verse 4. When Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness is not to end in death. And and you think, well, wait a minute. Lazarus got sick and then he died. (laughs) True, but that's not the end. This is not where this story ends. And, And the news of Lazarus' sickness is not news to Jesus. He knows where this is going. He knows what he was going to do. And then look at verse 6. Immediately after the statement, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, we expect to read verse 6 this way. So Jesus healed Lazarus from a distance, just like he had done before. I mean, of all of the people in Israel, this special love, these special friends that, that Jesus had affections for as humans ought to motivate him to heal Lazarus like he'd healed others. We might expect verse 6 to read, and so Jesus teleported himself to Bethany to heal Lazarus on the spot, like he had done at other times, transported himself miraculously from one place to another. No, we don't read either of these. Verse 6, so, it's like this conclusion of Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that he was sick, He stayed two days in the place where he was. Let me interpret that verse for you. Jesus let Lazarus die. Why? Because he loved him. Because he loved his sisters. (laughs) That doesn't compute with us. Jesus intends for them to experience grief upon grief and sorrow unto death and a a sickness that ends in the cessation of life on this earth. Jesus is good and he loves them, so he stays put. What does that tell you about Jesus' love for his people? It transcends our comfort at times, our health, our prosperity. And it transcends all of those temporal concerns straight to the glory of God and the self-disclosure of Jesus as the Son of God so that we get things way better than health and prosperity and physical comfort. 
This is a stunning scene. The disciples said to Jesus, uh, sorry, verse 7, Then after this, Jesus said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. Uh, So, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. That's where they're headed. But this is a couple days' walk to get there. And the disciples respond appropriately in verse 8, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going there again? Bethany is in the outskirts of Jerusalem. This is where Mary and Martha and Lazarus have their home. And it's in the neighborhood of the place they just left where they were trying to kill Jesus and and possibly the disciples. Jesus answers in verse 9, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he doesn't stumble. He sees the light of this world. If anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. In other words, Jesus, the light of the world is with them. We're going to do light business now, and so I have business near that place where they want to kill me. Of course, all of this is in the plan not just to raise Lazarus from the dead, but also for Jesus to march to his own death in Jerusalem. Verse 11, he said these things, and after he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, I go so that I may wake him. The disciples said, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll wake up. If he's in a coma, he'll revive, get some smelling salts, send a message, just wait around. Jesus has to be very clear. Verse 13, Jesus had spoken of his death. They thought he was speaking of actual sleep. So he said to them plainly, verse 14, Lazarus is dead. Now what's already happened in this scene? We we know that Lazarus is dead and Jesus calls it sleep. And if you're a reader of the New Testament, you're familiar with that metaphor already. There's something going on here in the way Jesus is already transforming the language of death for believers. But in order to make it clear, he says, Lazarus is dead. And then the next phrase, Jesus says, I am glad. That's not normal experience for us. The friend whom you love is dead. I'm glad. That's a jarring phrase. To come next. He says, I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. In other words, I'm glad for your sakes that Lazarus did die. Why? If Jesus had been there, I mean, everywhere Jesus was, the curse was reversed and death ran away. Jesus wasn't there. Lazarus died. Jesus is glad. Verse 15, so that you may believe. Let's go. Of course, Thomas here, uh, you know his first name. Thomas is his nickname. What's his first name? Doubting. (laughs) Man, poor kid, his parents called him that. What's wrong? (laughs) Why does he get called Doubting Thomas? Because I'm not going to believe unless I see the scars. Are you really risen? But here, he's not doubting Thomas. What does bold, courageous Thomas, called Didymus, say to his fellow disciples? Let's go also, so that we may die with him. There is belief in Thomas here that Jesus is worth following, even unto death. It's another angle on on Thomas. Verse 17, so when Jesus came, he found he had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about 15 stadia away, or just less than two miles. Many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. Uh, This was a wealthy family. They would have had friends. They would have had influential people. They would have had hangers-on who wanted to be around them who were wealthy and influential. And then you also had a group of people that were the professional mourners. These were those who were required by Jewish law, not biblical law, but Jewish traditional law. You were required to have two professional mourners and a flute player at a funeral scene. And that was so that these professional mourners could come in on cue, strike up the band, flute starts playing, and they wail, and they weep, and they mourn, and when the time is up, they stop, and they get paid, and they go to the next one. They're all there. 
Martha, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him. Mary was sitting in the house. So here's scene two outside of Bethany. Jesus is not at the tomb yet. Martha goes out to meet him. She knows he's coming. And Martha said to Jesus, and you could just imagine her leaving the scene. Jesus is on his way. I'm going to go meet him there outside of town. And she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And I don't think she's whining here. I don't think she's saying, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. I think she's saying, if you had been here, death had no place. If you and your love and your power had been on the scene, oh, what things would have happened. I think she's expressing faith here, not complaint. And look at the next verse. Even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus said, your brother will rise again. And notice the theology that the sisters have learned from Jesus during his earthly ministry. She said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus turns her attention from a future event to himself. With with these freighted words, I am. That's significant. The I am statements in the Gospel of John point to who he is ontologically. It is the ego, a, me of the Greek text, I am, which reflects the name Yahweh in the Old Testament. This is intentional and purposeful. And here he links this I am statement, not with an event, but with a reality. I am the resurrection, he says. I am the resurrection. Oh, I know he'll rise in the last day at the resurrection. No, I am the resurrection. This is striking and audacious and true. And so Jesus follows with these twin statements we're looking at. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never, ever die. So Jesus promises eternal life to all who would believe in him. Martha is the recipient of this conversation. And he promises this by declaring himself to be the resurrection. So there are two truths simultaneously every believer must cling to. If I believe in Jesus, I'm not going to die. And if I believe in Jesus, I will live even though I die. How do these ideas fit together? There's no contradiction here. In what sense can it be said that someone would live if he dies and promised to never die? Jesus is introducing his followers to a radical reconfiguration of the concepts of life and death. And I believe what he is saying here in seed form in John 11 is a rewriting of the vocabulary of death for the follower of Jesus. We hear Paul's refrain in 1 Corinthians 15, O oh, death, where is your sting? This is the beginning of another question. O oh, death, where is your vocabulary? Something's happening here in the way Jesus talks about death. I was so struck by this contradiction that turns out not to be a contradiction that I set out examining all of the vocabulary of death and dying in the New Testament. And the normal words for death are applied to unbelievers universally. To die, to kill, to be killed. Those words are used universally of unbelievers. Unbelievers are never said to sleep or go home or or some of the things we'll talk about for believers. But believers are only described by those words, the normal death words, when their suffering is being described, or their martyrdom or persecution is being described. So believers can be said to be killed, and when they're killed, they're said to die in those sort of persecution contexts. But outside of that, the vocabulary for Christian mortality changes radically. I've found 45, at least 45 different ways that a believer's death is described in the New Testament. And we'll get to those. We won't get to them this morning. That'll be a quipping hour for next week. We might call them euphemisms, except a euphemism is when you paint a pretty face on on an ugly thing. A euphemism is when you call something nice that isn't really nice. 
And, and so euphemism is not the right word. Jesus actually transforms what death is for a Christian. And so the vocabulary follows suit. He can talk about it as going home, departing, being absent from the body, or sleeping. We'll, we'll talk about those next week. But I think all of that starts right here in John 11 with this conversation with Martha. There's a sense in which believer is never going to die. And a sense in which, yep, dying, yep, got that, but, but you live. So what I want to do is allow these realities to recalibrate the way we think about death. We're going to be all over the New Testament this morning um, in a, in a nine-part survey of the New Testament's teaching on death. And I'm going to give you these sort of categorical statements um, and, and we'll look at nine of those, and then there are sub-statements under the statements. So again, this is a complicated uh, outline uh, with way too much information to try to write down, uh, but the notes are available for you, the passages are there for you, um, and we have it up on the screen. So the first part of the survey is this statement, unbelievers are dead. Unbelievers are dead. Uh, unbelievers are dead already. Unbelievers are the living dead. Uh, John Wayne, the, not a prophet, not an apostle, um, but a movie actor and a cowboy said, you may be walking around, but you're dead as a beaver hat. There, there's a kind of death that is a walking around kind of deadness. And, and that is the death that unbelievers are in. They are the living dead. They, they produce dead works. And the reality is, all are spiritually dead until they are in Christ. Here's Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. And you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh. Where did we live? In this death. What did we walk in this condition called deadness? That we lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. We were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Ephesians 2.5 says, when we were dead in our transgressions, God made us alive. So this was true of believers. When we were in unbelief, we were dead. Colossians 2.13, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh... He made you alive together with Him, having forgiven the transgressions. And not only are unbelievers dead, their works are dead. Listen to Hebrews 6.1. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Entrance into the Christian life is a repentance, a, a turning from some things to other things, a, a turning from yourself and to God, a turning from sin and to God. But here in Hebrews 6.1, it is a turning from dead works. That is, what, what can dead men produce? Only the products of death. They're called dead works. Hebrews 9.14, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works? to serve the living God. And what's fascinating about Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 9, describing the activities of the walking dead, he's not describing the, the, the wretched activities of the overtly sinful things that everybody would go, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. By dead works, he's referring to the things the world would say, that's relative goodness, that's right, that's good, that's clean, that's religious. They actually need to be repented of. They actually need to be forgiven, and they are dead works. Not only are their works dead, but their faith is dead. You know the phrase in James 2.15, faith without works, being by itself, is dead. James 2.26, as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. That is, the, the kind of works that the Holy Spirit produces in a life are the manifest evidence of a transformed life by that Spirit. Genuine faith, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, 
produced by the Holy Spirit of God that comes by grace through faith, results in works that we walk in, Ephesians 2.10. And without those spirit-wrought works, there is no spirit-wrought faith. So there's a kind of works that is dead for the dead men walking, and there's a kind of faith that is dead because it doesn't go along with the things the Holy Spirit produces at new birth. Churchgoers can be dead. 1 Timothy 5.6 describes those who give themselves to wanton pleasure are dead even while they live. So these are churchgoers at Ephesus, particularly in the women's ministry, uh, specifically widows who have given themselves over to wanton pleasure. They're not living spiritually. They're described as dead walking. And they're churchgoers. Whole churches can be described as dead. Revelation 3.1, Jesus writes, To the angel of the church in Sardis write, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, you have a name that you are alive, but you, church at Sardis, are dead. The whole church can be dead. Of course, the gospel is preached to the dead. When we preach to those who don't yet know Christ, we are preaching to those who are spiritually dead. 1 Peter 4, 6, the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. Next, we discover that unbelievers do not possess life. 1 John 3, 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. If you're an unbeliever, you do not possess eternal life. It is not abiding in you. 1 John 5, 12, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. Also, unbelievers will be judged as the dead. 1 Peter 4, 5, they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. 2 Timothy 4, 1, Christ Jesus will judge the living and the dead. In Revelation 20, 12, I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. Books were opened, another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged from the things written in the books, the great record of all the deeds, seen and unseen, by every unforgiven dead man walking from all time, and they were judged according to their deeds. So unbelievers are dead. That's the starting point for our understanding of, of our relationship to death as followers of Christ. The second major heading out of the nine is this, unbelievers will die. So they are the walking dead and they will die. Romans 5.12, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, so death spread to all men on account of which all sinned. This starting point is when Adam disobeyed, death entered the world. The spiritual death that then is the ground from which all of us spiritually dead from birth sin. And listen to Romans 5.14, death reigned. Death reigned. Over those who sinned uh, like Adam and those who sin in other ways, in other eras, Death is universal because sin is universal, and sin is universal because spiritual death is universal, all the way back from that first sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, in Adam all die. Hebrews 9, 27 makes it clear, it is appointed for men to die once and then to face judgment. So what do we have so far? Dead men walking will die and then face judgment. That leads us to a third foundational reality. Unbelievers will die again. So they start out born spiritually dead. They die physically and they will face yet another death. This is the second death. Listen to Hebrews, I'm sorry, uh, Revelation 2.11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And the one who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. There is a second death coming. Revelation 20, verse 6, Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. 
According to verse 14 of Revelation 20, the second death is the lake of fire. That is hell or eternal conscious torment under the wrath of God. It is unending and unflinching judgment of God's holy justice against those who do not repent in this life. Revelation 21.8 says this, For the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars... Their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So unbelievers are dead. Unbelievers will die, and unbelievers will die again. The fourth reality we need to grapple with from the New Testament when we think about the language of death there is that believers died already. Believers died already. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ here this morning, it's true that you were born dead and you were walking dead, but then a day came when you got saved and you died. And it happened already. You see, believers died at conversion. Listen to Colossians 3.3. You have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Believers died at conversion. And believers died with Christ. Listen to 2 Timothy 2.11. It is a trustworthy statement. If we died with Him, past tense, if we died with Jesus, we will also live with Him. Romans 6, verse 3. Do you not know, Christian, that all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into His death? Therefore, we have been buried with Him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too now walk in newness of life. We have become united with Him in the likeness of His death, certainly also in the likeness of His resurrection living. That is past tense for the believer. Romans 6, 8, we have died with Christ, and we believe we shall also live with Him. We also discover in the New Testament that believers died in their relationship to sin. Believers have a a relationship to sin, but it is not what it was. The the relationship to sin you were born in is a, a relationship of slavery. Picked up in Romans 7, it is the language of a master and slaves. Sin personified is the master, and we are slaves. Jesus said in John 8, if anyone sins, he's a slave of sin. And a slave can't get out from under his master unless that relationship, that slavery relationship, be severed. If a slave is dead, a master can't tell the slaves what to do. And so death changes the relationship. And our union with Jesus in his death fundamentally changes the believer's relationship to sin. No longer a slave. Sin is no longer master. There is freedom from that relationship to sin's mastery and and dominion by being joined to Christ. And that union with Christ comes in our union with His death. Romans 6, 8, or 6, 6 and 7, Our old self was crucified with Him so that our body of sin might be progressively done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves of sin. He who has died is free with reference to sin. A believer's death union with Christ also affects another relationship. We would say it this way, believers died in reference to the law. Romans 7, 4, Therefore, my brethren, you were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you would be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. And while the unbeliever's relationship to sin is described as a slave-master relationship, the unbeliever's relationship to law is described as a marriage. And a marriage is dissolved by death. I see you shivering. It got cold. It was hot when we started. Okay, we're talking about death and life, polar extremes. This is just an illustration, a very tangible illustration of the polar extremes. I don't know what the number's supposed to be. Ben's checking on it. Thanks, Ben. Or he's getting another coat. (laughs) Every man for himself. It's warmer in the hallway. 
I'm cold. I never even notice the temperature. I have to, I have to look around, but I'm, I'm cold now. The unbeliever is married to law, an indissoluble union except by death. And think about the tragedy of this situation. If you're a slave of sin, you can't do anything but sin. And if you're married to law, and that marriage partner has three purposes, none of which is to rescue you from sin or its consequences. Those three purposes are to tell you what the standard is, aggravate you to violate the standard even more, and then condemn you for having violated it. And you're married to it. What a tragic situation for an unbeliever. A slave to sin, married to the law. This is why human religion fails. Give me some rules. Give me some regulations. Give me some law. And I'll abide by it. I'll fix the sin problem. It fails. Whether you're using Mosaic law, New Testament commands, some other hokey religion, or any self-help tricks you want to set about to make, you can't keep it. And it is wed to you until you die. Which is why Paul says, when you come to Christ, you die. You die with reference to the law. This death fundamentally changes the relationship. Galatians 2.19 says the same thing. For through the law, I died with reference to the law, so that I might live to God. What's the implication? As long as you're married to law and a slave of sin, you can't live to God. (laughs) It's not going to happen. Next, we discover in the New Testament that believers died in reference to the world. You have a relationship to sin as an unbeliever, you have a relationship to law as an unbeliever, and you have a relationship to the world. You're just part of it. You're in the great amalgam of rebellious humanity, unable to extricate yourself from your own situation. But Colossians 2.20, if you have died with Christ with reference to the elementary principles of the world... That is an argument from the reality of the Christian life. The way the world works, the way the world thinks, the operating principles and governance of the world, your death union with Christ severs you from it. You're not of it. You might be in it, but you're not of it. You're fundamentally different. And so we might summarize the relationship to death for the believer in this section this way. The old you is no more. You died. The old you. There's a new you. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I died and I live. Yeah, you're more alive than you ever were. <laughs> But that started with your death, which came after your walking deadness after you were born. It's a really incredible picture. Galatians 5, 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Romans 6, 6. Our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be progressively done away with so we would no longer be slaves. Ephesians 4. In reference to your former manner of life, you laid aside the old self. The Greek is paleos anthropos, paleo, pale, pale, uh, paleo something, paleontology. What, who, what, what's the guy that studies old stuff? The scientist. Paleontologist, paleontologist thank you. It's the old things, old dead things, and the paleos anthropos is the, the old man. It's not a nickname for your dad. It's the old you. He is no more. He's been laid aside. You are now to go on being renewed in the spirit of your mind. And in the gospel, you put on a new self, which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Colossians 3, don't lie to one another since you laid aside the old man, the paleos anthropos, the old self. You have put on the new self. That old person's gone, dead. Have you ever told your testimony that way? I was born in 1974. I died when I was eight years old. Then I finished elementary school. I went to junior high and high school. Now here I am. That is a Christian testimony. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but I live. I live by faith. 
Christ lives in me. This is new. Old man, new man. Separated by death. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, he must take up his cross and follow me. Number five this morning, we discover in the New Testament that eternal life begins at new birth. Eternal life begins at new birth. John 5, 24, this is the text we'll look at this morning in our main service. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment. He has passed out of death into life. John 8, 51. If anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Romans 6, 4. We have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Romans 6, 5, if we have become united with Him in the likeness of His death, we shall also be united with Him in the likeness of His resurrection. Romans 6, 8, if we've died with Christ, we also live with Him. Romans 6, 11, so consider yourselves to be dead with reference to sin, but alive with reference to God in Christ Jesus. Interesting implication of that reality. If you're a Christian, you, you did die. And now you live a new life. Therefore, think like that. Act like that. He says in verse 13, Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments, literally weapons, of unrighteousness. But instead, present your whole selves to God as those alive from the dead. And present your members, your faculties, your body, your emotions, your will, all of it, Present all of that as weapons of righteousness to God. And think about that imagery as a very practical implication of this doctrine of death to life. Your old slave master, sin, by the way, you you liked it when you were there. And maybe you started to grow weary of it, but you you didn't understand the fundamental problem. And every day you you walked into that slave master's uh, room, throne room, this, this slave master king who was the head over your dominion. And you said, here's my weapons, take them, do what you want with them. And, and you died and you were transferred from the dominion of darkness into the dominion of God's son. You went from the reign of sin, Romans 5, 20 and 21, to the reign of grace. And now under this new dominion, You still have those implements, your mind, your tongue, your thoughts, your will, your affections, your emotions, your body, and you bring that into the throne room of your new master, your king, who actually loves you and is not bent on your destruction, but has all the resources for you to live and to have life abundantly, and you offer him your implements or your weapons. What's he going to do with them? His glory, your good. And the practical implication is this. That old slave master who has no right over you, you've been removed from his dominion, your death has severed the relationship, he can't tell you what to do, and yet the temptation with residual sin in the Christian life as we go, yeah, I still got these implements, and yeah, I kind of miss that guy. Hey, uh, you know, here's these weapons, what do you want to do with them today? That's a graphic picture for what we're doing when we're sinning as believers. Handing over weapons, dangerous weapons, to that old master who is bent on our destruction. Well, what's he going to do with them if he just plays with them for a little while? Of course, all of that's personified. That old slave master is you. You can't blame it on somebody outside of you. You can't blame it on your circumstances. It's not Satan. It's a, a way to personify sin when sin was your master in unbelief and a dirty companion in your walk in the Christian life. But you're not a slave and you're newly alive. So you have this command in Colossians 3.1. If you have been raised up with Christ, and it is appropriate in that text to read that since you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Sixth, and we'll close with this one this morning. A believer's life 
is a kind of death. A believer's life is a kind of death. It's a death to self. It's a death to the world. It's a death to sin. It's putting to death the deeds of the body. Here, this New Testament language of death and dying and killing is applied to the Christian life. First of all, death to self is the starting point for following Jesus. Jesus said in Mark 8, 34, He summoned the crowd with His disciples. If anyone wishes to come after Me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow Me. And of course, the cross was not jewelry or pretty architecture on a building. It was an emblem of death of a most gruesome kind. That's the starting point in the Christian life. If you've been introduced to Jesus with with some hokey promise of add a little Jesus to your life and and the life as you know it will just, you know, it'll go a little better. Kind of a a pep talk, a TED talk, the the next little thing, you splash of something you need to add for self-improvement. You have not been told the gospel. (laughs) The gospel starts with you are the problem and the problem is deeper than you ever realized. You've offended a holy God and your very life is in jeopardy. To use the illustration from Jonathan Edwards, you are as a spider who is loathsome to his creator, hanging by a thread over the fire. That is the reality. And you need help and you need rescue. And the God who is judge loves to rescue sinners who will look to him in faith. And the extrication of your soul from that predicament comes with the invitation to die. Take up your cross, follow me. That's the way in. That's the entrance point. That's the front door of the Christian life. Not some add a little Jesus and your life gets better. But come follow me. I'll give you life. Cost you everything. And it's free. All at the same time. Secondly, considering yourself dead to sin is an ongoing practice. Romans 6, 11, consider yourselves dead with reference to sin, but alive to God. Ongoing command for the way you think about your life. Colossians 3, 3, 5, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Next, putting to death the deeds of the body identifies one as a child of God. How do you know you're a Christian, according to Romans 8, if the Holy Spirit dwells in you? How do I know if the Holy Spirit's dwelling in me? He leads you to put to death the deeds of the body. You see that activity of a fight and a warfare that you didn't have in your before life, now active in your life. Oh, I hate sin. I don't like it. I, I love God and I've offended God and I, I just I want to be pleasing to Him. Where does that come from? That's the presence of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer waging war with residual depravity. The, the, the hangover, if you will, of your former life. The Holy Spirit present leads you to put those things to death. It identifies you as a Christian. We also see that believers are dead with reference to the world in which they live. Galatians 6.14, Paul says, The world has been crucified to me and I to the world. You think about your old life that way? Dead to me. Have you dead-named your former life? Dead-named the world in which you were uh, in relationship to, you were a part of, you you were in the system called the tyranny of sin. You were part of the world, and now that's changed. And then we discover that believers can find themselves in danger of death because of their loyalty to Christ. And as I said earlier, this is where the death language finds its way into the physical mortality of Christians. Uh, When what's in view in a passage is somebody wants to kill you, Then we find these normal death, dying, and killing words show up related to a Christian going out of this life. 2 Corinthians 1.9, Paul says, We had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. 2 Corinthians 2.16, Paul describes him and his associates, and by implication believers, as those who have an aroma of death unto death and life unto life. A Christian smells like death to the enemies of the gospel. But a Christian smells like life to those who have been raised unto new life. 
And, and that's the reality. You, you can live your life trying to be liked by everybody, but, but the more you smell like Jesus, the more you will carry about in yourself the aroma of death. That, that scene is striking. Paul is picking up the imagery of the victory march of a Roman army. They come back into the city to be celebrated by the emperor, to be rewarded with houses and lands and prizes. Some have won their citizenship into the empire that way. And they are dragging behind them the captives of war. Those whom they've taken alive who will be brought to the Colosseum, who will be brought to the the, the center place of Rome and slaughtered on the spot before the emperor. And what happens in this grand parade is, is there are flowers thrown by the crowd into the parade arena. And as the marchers, the soldiers at the front end trample the flowers, the, the the whole city would smell of those flowers trampled under the, under the sandals of those soldiers. What are the guys in the cages smelling? <laughs> oh, they, they might get nostrils full of the sweet perfume of crushed flowers, but it is their own death they march to. It is the aroma of death. Um, <laughs> how should a Christian smell? Well, it, it's offensive to the world around us. And yet it is the victory march of Jesus. Here all the metaphors sort of get mixed up. Uh, Those whom the world despises are actually the victors over death being led by Jesus in his triumphal procession. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.11, we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake. He says, we are unknown yet well-known. We are dying, yet behold, we live. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three. 23. He says, I have been in labor and imprisonment, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Jesus, in his letter to the church at Smyrna, says, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested. You will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. And we said before that taking up your cross and following Jesus is the entrance point of the Christian life. It is also the daily discipline of the Christian life. Listen to Jesus' words in Luke 9, 23. He was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself Take up his cross daily and follow me. What do death and life mean to the Christian? Uh, This topic is rich and we're not done. Uh, We'll tackle the last three descriptions next time we're together, Lord willing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for life. Life on your earth is a precious gift. You give this gift freely And the world in which we were born, the world in which we operated, the world in which we lived as spiritually dead men is ungrateful for your gift of life. We don't understand it, we trample it. And then you have intervened in the lives of believers to bring life out of death. And we have been crucified with Christ and no longer live, but now we live You've changed everything for us by uniting us to your son in his death. And we pray as we go out from this place that we would see ourselves differently, that we would look at life and death differently. We would look at it through the lens of your word. Jesus, when you spoke to Mary and to Martha, and by raising Lazarus from the dead, you you spoke to the watching crowd there. You changed what death is for those who follow you. We praise you for that. We look to you as the conqueror of death, the one who died in our place to bring us life, and praise you. Amen.